Hello and welcome to My Friend the Rainbow Circle, episode 57. Um, something happened locally recently that made national news. I tried this one time, I couldn't get my adverb straight. Um, uh, and it relates to a lot of what I've been talking about in previous episodes. Um, it was uh, a case of a local county um, uh, banning a couple of books uh, from the list. Um, and just from my perspective as an educator, you know, of course, as a writer, uh, banning anything is offensive. Um, but that sort of has a mixed perspective as an educator, because I see a situation like this. You know, as an English teacher, I would say, let's look at that situation and analyze what's going on. Let's break apart the, um, you know, the justification for that, the logic behind the banning. Um, but it's a really fascinating juxtaposition of different pieces um because the main thing that has made the news the main thing can you sit down Bo? please please just sit down just sit down okay the main thing that made the news you just have to get in my face okay can you be still the main thing that has made the news is the banning of a book called dear martin um which uh it would, the justification was that it was um, for offensive material. And there was another book um, called uh, Regeneration by Pat Parker that was banned. And that, that had LGBT characters. Um, and so Mar Martin being a reference to Martin Luther King. So the, the assumption just in banning those two was that the motivation was racist and it was homophobic. Um, which might be totally valid. This I have no dog in this fight. I'm not making any comment on that. Um, but I, the part that makes me really curious and fascinated is that the third book was The Curious Incident of the Dog at Nighttime, um, which uh, the claim was that it had offensive material. But another book that was okay, it deemed okay, is Into the Wild by John Krakauer. And I think looking at those two side by side gives you a very different picture. Because a lot of the news was that they banned Dear Martin, um, but they thought Jurassic Park was acceptable. And I think just putting those two side by side, you know, just accepting that on the one level, I mean, just looking at it from an analytical perspective as, as an English teacher, from an analytical level, one, one hypothesis that we can make, you know, and it's, a probably a valid hypothesis is that just looking at that comparison, um, and I've heard this explanation too, but looking at that comparison, the justification might be that Jurassic Park has cis white males, um, Dear Martin is about African American characters, what's at the root of that is is just ra racism, and that's, and I can understand that as a valid um, argument. But then what's really baffling and is worth analyzing is how you how you make that hypothesis and make Curious Incident fit, which is fascinating. It's a fascinating question, um, especially in direct comparison to um, Into the Wild. Um, and, you know, commonly the claim is, you know, it's a it's it's a much more conservative county. And so the claim is that. The books that were banned had more liberal politics, um, and that was at the root of it. But then you look at Into the Wild, which is about a kid who burns his money and forsakes um, uh, the capitalist system. It in he ends up, you know, spoiler alert, uh, he ends up eating the wrong berries and dying. So you know, is that part of it that maybe the main character is espousing this anti-capitalist position? Um, which is, you know, a fiscally conservative person would, would certainly be object, uh, would object to, um, but because he, you know, because he eats the wrong berries at the end and dies, um, maybe that's why they don't object to it, you know, but it's really baffling sort of a question that it creates a different answer if all you look at is Curious Incident next to Into the Wild than if you look at Dear Martin next to Jurassic Park. Um, uh, but if you look at Curious Incident, it doesn't, it has as much offensive material as Into the Wild does. Um, and it's a bit about cis white 
male main character, but he's on the autism spectrum. Um, and so the logical implication then, if Dear Martin was banned because of racism and uh, Regeneration was banned because of homophobia, was Curious Incident banned because of prejudice against people on the autism spectrum? Um, that's a hypothesis. There's some validity to that. Um, so from one perspective, that could be it. Um, I'm not making any argument that that's absolutely true. Um, but, uh, it relates to a lot of what I've been talking about. The dogs are going to be loud. They only really get loud when I start doing this. Seiko, stop being loud. I'm censoring you. I'm censoring your loudness right now. Siku, are you being loud? <laughs> yes, you're being very loud. Chewing something in there. So anyway, <laughs> speaking of censorship, that's my main that's my main concern. Censorship is rooted in this is what I was talking about in the last episode, but um, censorship is rooted in that whole concept of the dualistic absolutes. Um the good language and the bad language, and uh, I think a lot of, I mean, if we take it as, to be, I mean, if we disregard the hypothesis that it is racist and homophobic and anti, um, people on the autism spectrum, very troubling if a school takes that position. That is a lot of people's explanation, but very, very troubling if that is what the actual explanation is. But if we take the explanation that it's really just the offensive material, which logically that doesn't pan out either. But if we take the, that explanation, uh, that goes back to the same sort of explanation of, of you know, I use the example of anti-vaxxers who want, who take, speaking of autism spectrum, take this difficult thing to understand, autism, autism spectrum, uh, and they want an easy explanation for it. Something that they can palpably uh, eliminate, you know, otherwise, what can they do? You know, they can go through a much more complicated process of, you know, caring for their child, or they can do something that has no evidence that, that would ha may have any help whatsoever, which is, um, stop vaccinations. Um, it has evidence, it has all the scientific evidence that it would do harm. Um, but that's a, a mind frame that, is at the root of censorship of offensive material. And I say this as, as someone who, who's been obsessed with Allen Ginsberg for years, but this is what Allen Ginsberg dealt with. Um, and this was a big part of his, his censorship trial uh, in uh, 1957. Um, and Judge Horn's conclusion was that it had literary merit. So even though it had offensive material, the government couldn't censor it, um, despite having, uh, you know, graphic descriptions of, of sexu sexual uh, acts that were forbidden in, legally in the United States at the time. Um, it was, Howell was uh, um, seized because it was offensive um, and put on trial in 1957, and Judge Horn determined that, and, it, and there well-documented trial, all kinds of different testimony about the literary merit of Howell. Um, and it was deemed to have literary merit, and therefore the government couldn't censor it. But logically, and this is the same sort of logic that goes into, you know, looking at a situ you know, a much smaller situation like the anti-vaxxer movement. Logically, what is the harm in reading um, bad word, quote-unquote bad words? You know, what is the harm in um, high school kids reading quote unquote bad words that they would um, hear in other contexts anyway. Um, logically, you know, any sort of evidence that you apply to that, um, you would say, why would reading Curious Incident um, and Into the Wild for that matter um, or, you know, Dear Martin or Regeneration what actual harm would come from the quote-unquote bad words. And there's really no evidence for that. But 
it's a way of doing something. I mean, just to be generous. I mean, certainly as a writer, you know, one of the most offensive things from that perspective is to censor anything. But just to be empathetic and try to understand the perspective of someone who would want that. Um, the mind frame is that um, there's so much to raising a child. I'm raising a, a seven-year-old um, about to turn eight. Um, there's so many complicated things um, that are really, really difficult to do in raising a child really well. Um, but one thing you can recognize and manage is something that's ultimately relevant, the bad words. And I don't let my son say bad words, and I try to explain to him. I say, you know, if he lets one slip, I say, that's not something you say in polite company. Uh, try to control yourself. And the context there is I explain to him that these are words that bother certain people. These are not words that you need to say in public. Uh, in polite company, uh, contextually, that is the actual issue, is um, you don't want a kid saying bad words in polite company. Um, I don't think hearing the bad words is going to harm him in any way. We listened to Ready Player One, Ready Player One uh, on the audiobook. It had a lot of bad words. That's really the only thing that would be offensive about that one. Um, but I've told him many times, you know, you recognize that's a bad word, quote unquote, bad word. You don't say that in public, don't say that in polite company. Um, and he's good about that. I mean, he recognizes that, so that sort of um, social situation where um, the reason, the what makes this a bad word is, you know, the, the company that you're in and, and, you know, what could be potentially offensive to others if you repeat it. But simply reading it. There's actually no harm that actually comes from reading it. There's no evidence that there is any harm that comes from reading a bad word. But uh, of all of the complexities of raising a child, um, one thing that you have some control over uh, and you're able to recognize fairly easily and you're able to you know, make efforts in eliminating is the so-called bad words. You know, there's so many other things that you can't control. So part of the mind frame of word policing is it takes a really complicated situation and boils it down to something that is ultimately irrelevant. Um, doesn't make it good, doesn't make it right. Just like any vaxxer, I'm, no, I'm trying to understand the mind frame. Um, doesn't make it good, doesn't make it right. Um, it just is understandable that, that there's this desperate need to um, to find something to control. But on the flip side of that, speaking of empathy, um, I think the pretty significant value, I mean, if you look at the pattern, it, it does seem to be focusing a lot of the censorship on not necessarily polit <laughs> politically. <laughs> hey, babe, what's up? I was censoring you before, and I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. So, <laughs> it puts a lot of the focus. I love you, too. Okay, just stay right there. Be still. Stay right there. I'm trying to talk. Can I just talk? Can I just talk? <laughs> so, that pa it, it, uh, it does favor cis white males. Um, even though... <laughs> And non-autistic, it's white male. Uh, even though politically, if you really read into uh, into the wild, it is about a guy who's anti-capitalist. So you should think that if it's just purely, <laughs> if it's just purely a conservative issue, <laughs> where you know there's some political objection to it from a fiscally conservative perspective, you would think they would be objecting to into the wild also. However, recognizing those subtleties takes a lot more effort in delving into some incomprehensible, you know, complexities that identifying bad words is a lot easier to do. Um, so I think that's at the root of, of the actual issue. And Into the Wild has plenty of bad words too. But 
part of the value of having books like Dear Martin or books like Regeneration or books like um, Curious Incident is it, on the one hand, I mean, part of the argument is that kids in school need to have books about, <laughs> books about themselves. Um, so African-American kids need books about African-American characters. LGBT kids need books about LGBT, <laughs> LGBTQIA plus um, characters. Um, and kids with, on the autism spectrum need books about them. And there, there's a very, very compelling case uh, for that. But I would argue, I would add on to that, just as a case for why books like that are very, very important. Um, I would, I would not want to claim that the only kind of characters, this is, this is part of the danger of the, the universal there, the, you know, the, the potentially problematic universal that might come from that. I would avoid the universal of saying that kids can only relate to, <laughs> kids can only relate to characters who are like them in some way. Um, to say that, uh, African American kids can only relate to African American characters would be pro problematic. To say like LGBT kids can only relate to LGBT characters would be problematic. Uh, just like saying white students can only relate to, <laughs> to white characters. Um, that gets into problematic territory because arguably I don't need this right now. Why are you licking me? Stop. Look here, okay. I love you, but look that way. Do not lick my face, please. I'm trying to make a I'm trying to make a really important serious point. <laughs> You're licking my face. Okay. <laughs> sit still. Okay, you're gonna sit still? Sit still. Okay. My very important serious point is this. Part of the value, yes, absolutely, is that Kids of different backgrounds are in <laughs> very different situations are definitely going to have characters they can relate to on that level. However, arguably, just as important, maybe more important, is that you have characters you can relate to who don't share your background. So you have characters... What? I'm not paying attention to you, and so... <laughs> Stop trying to lick my face. Okay. Hi. Okay. You have characters who may not have a similar background to you, and by having this very intimate experience, arguably that only fiction can give. I mean, you could certainly have movies and TV shows and what have you who have these characters that you ha can have this intense and empathetic experience with. I would definitely argue that that's, that's very true of movies and TV shows. However, fiction has a very special sort of bond that the reader and the writer have, or the reader and the characters have, in that it does feel much more intimately inside of your head. So if you have a character like Curious Incident, the, the main character in that, um, who is on the autism spectrum, uh, somebody who's not on the autism spectrum can read that book and be inside somebody's head who's on the autism spectrum. That's extremely powerful. So certainly somebody with autism, you know, can relate to that. But very powerful effect is that someone without autism is able to read that book and is able to be inside that person's head for hours and hours and hours they read the whole book hours and hours and hours living inside that person's head so someone without autism would then next time they meet someone with autism um just by the very nature of autism there's a complication in actually connecting and communicating with someone with autism um but by reading a book for hours and hours being inside of this character's head, they have much more developed capacity for empathy for that character or for that real person by being with the character, having empathy for the character, by being with that actual, 
autistic person, they have a much more developed capacity for empathy. Um, and that's true, you know, uh, African American characters being inside their head, being in their situation. If that's not your background, you're developing a stronger capacity for for empathy or people that aren't aren't from your background. If you know LGBTQIA plus um, characters being inside their heads, being in their lives, uh, you know, being in that very intimate setting of a, f a piece of fiction, where just by its very nature, it's you know deeply paradoxically empathetic living someone else's life for a very you know an extended period of time uh, that develops the capacity um of the you know the the reader to feel empathy for that person to understand that person's experience much more effectively um so arguably um, and this is always my position when it comes to you know, the politics of a fictional piece. There's no obligation for any piece to have to take a political position. Um, however, uh, the effect that it has, you know, there's no obligation for it to teach a lesson. But arguably, the lesson that it does teach is a very powerful one. Being able to empathetically experience the life of somebody who might have some some similar background to you but also being able to experience the life of somebody who hasn't and a very powerful piece of fiction is able to able to do that really effectively and ultimately if they say bad words if they don't say bad words bad words an entirely irrelevant factor and so <laughs> now the cats are destroying everything and entirely, I'll make my final point, and I'll go check on what the animals have destroyed elsewhere in the house. Um, the bad words are an entirely irrelevant factor. They have no actual discernible negative effect whatsoever in somebody's life. Arguably, if there's a case where a bad word has actually harmed anyone ever, I would be interested in looking at evidence. Um, that would be fascinating evidence. However, the more complicated and difficult thing is living somebody else's life and having that empathetic experience. It's a much more powerful, much more positive thing. Uh, any sort of harm you can conceive of that could come from hearing a bad word, it's drowned under an ocean of positive effect of an empathetic experience. But really, the, the problem tends to be that uh, it's easy to identify bad words. It's much more difficult to accept the, the multi-level complexity of going through this very paradoxical emotional experience with another character and recognizing the value of it. But that's my soapbox. Hopefully I'm done with political topics, but politics is really not my favorite thing to talk about. But this is, you know, from an analytical perspective, it's a very fascinating juxtaposition because you do have these five very different books. And so identifying which ones are good and which ones are bad and really exploring why anyone would choose those particular three is bad and the, you know those two examples that come up always in this in this discussion is good it's really fascinating really fascinating thing to to discuss so have a good day i'll see you on the next episode